Hey, hey, good morning, Southridge family. Hey, if you're in the room, say, I'm in the room. Awesome. You look great. Great. number of folks still making their way in, and uh, we are just going to have a glorious time worshiping the Lord this morning. Uh, thanks for being here. There's nothing like being in the room. Amen? Uh, if you're not in the room and you're, you're connecting with us online, we want to just welcome you and thank you for joining us. Um, you can just insert questions or anything right in the chat. We'd love to interact with you and help answer any questions or uh, minister to you, pray for you in some way. So just let us know how we can do that. Uh, for everyone that's in the room, right in front of you, you're gonna see this little uh, connect card. Uh, I encourage you to grab that, uh, fill it out. Uh, just let us know how we can love you, how we can pray for you. Maybe you have special needs or, or something that you just kinda wanna share. Maybe you have a question, you just love to get with someone and talk about that. We'd love to be able to do that with you. So you can fill this out physically. You can also just scan that little QR code. For those of you that uh, wonder what in the world that little thing is, you were probably born before 1970. Um, so yeah, some of you got that. But anyway, it is just great to be in the house of the Lord. Number of things coming up. Hopefully you get the weekly email that goes out uh, with all of our news and information. If you don't get that, First off, check your spam folder. And if you don't know what that is, you were probably born before 1970 as well. Um, but check your spam folder, just make sure that you are not getting that. But if you wanna get that, we'd love to get that to you every week with all the news, all the information, sermon prep information, small group study guide, all that stuff is there every week in our email. You can jump on, let us know you'd like to get that and we'd love to put that in your hands. Uh, guys, any guys in the room? Are you a man in the room? All right, all right. You're probably just driving over the NCAA tournament that's coming up and all that. But I wanna invite you to set all that stuff aside tonight and come in this room and join us as men uh, as we gather. Uh, we're gonna eat, because that's what one of the things guys love to do, amen? We love to eat and we love Jesus and we love our families and we love our city. And so, but we're gonna meet right here. Uh, guys, if you have not registered already, I encourage you to go ahead and do that. Um, if you wanna eat, come and eat. If you wanna come but not eat, just show up. Uh, the guys have been working all day yesterday, smoking a bunch of pork and all kinds of stuff. And we're just gonna meet, we're gonna eat, we're gonna fellowship, we're gonna look at God's word. We're gonna get a challenge uh, as to what it is God is calling us as men to do uh, as we lead our church to help reach our city. So if you're a man, I would love to have you back with us tonight right here in the room. All the information is at sfchurch.com. Lots of things coming up for Easter. All that information is there. Check it out. we got a Good Friday service coming up. Uh, we got Easter Jam this week. Three services on Easter with different times, so don't get confused over that. But uh, press in and just be part of the body of Christ as we desire to live as family together. As we jump into worship this morning, I just want to read a, a, a quick passage of scripture for us to set our hearts and, and minds to worship. Psalm 148 says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his heavenly hosts. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him all you shining stars. Praise him highest heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. From his very spoken word, God created all things. His very name, Jehovah God, says that he is the sovereign one, set apart from all of his creation. And so as we come in this place, we are here for him. Not, not to come and, and to serve him and to do things for him, but simply to seek after his presence because he is worthy of our praise. Let's pray together. Father, as we gather in this place, we gather for you. We are here for you because you are worthy to receive honor and praise and glory. And so Father, as we gather for you in this place, I pray that you touch our hearts and lives, our minds. God, as we press into your word, that you would meet us in this place, that our lives would be different. They would be changed because we've been in your presence with your people. We praise you this morning in Jesus' name, amen.
for me Jesus to fully praise you it would take all eternity just like Lazarus oh
we thank you for all that you've done for us today. It's very much like us to see the things on the outside that you have done for us, the ways that you provide with physical means. But I truly believe that the greater miracle is the thing that you've done inside of us. Lord, you have, just like Lazarus, Lord, you have called us from death to life. You've breathed the breath of life, life into us once again. And that life that is within us now, Lord, is yours. No longer I who live, but Christ in me. So God, as we spend time in your presence today, I pray that we would be more and more filled with your spirit today. We would be more and more like you today. We're praying all this in Jesus' name and all God's people said together, amen. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. Good morning, church. Um, as we are diving in, we're continuing our series on Church Reimagined, and as we're kind of getting into this, I wanted you to bring to mind the picture of a face of the first person that you knew who got an iPhone. So 17 years ago, the iPhone 1 came out. I want you to think of that person. Some of you guys, I look, and you're like looking at that person because they're here in the room. Um, others of you are are thinking of somebody that you probably hadn't seen in a long time. And, and as you're thinking of that, uh, with the iPhone, right, we, it was this new technology. I want, what did you think of it? I remember I was in high school, and I know for some of you that makes me too young, and for some of you it also makes me too old. Um, but I was in high school, and I remember uh, this girl in my class, she got one, and I remember thinking, that thing is crazy expensive. How did she get that? And there's no way that touchscreen is going to work. Um, so just a quick pop quiz, though, to see if high school Danny was right. How many of you have iPhones? Oh, okay. Okay. So apparently, uh, don't don't take uh, everything I was saying back then as uh, as as hard facts. But it was it was a, something that came into the world, and we had no idea when that first one came out how it was going to impact us today. And we have been in the book of Acts, reading um, about kind of the birth of the church. And as we've been studying the book of Acts. There's been a paradigm shift, right? They've, they've gone from this old way, and they, and they had Jesus, and they were following him, and now it's the church. And what does church look like? And in a lot of ways, that kind of parallels that iPhone 1. And what's interesting is we're looking back at it, though. We don't use an iPhone 1 anymore. We're using our iPhone 15s. And with this iPhone 15, right, we have similar issues, but they're not the same. And so as we study this book of Acts, and I'll give a, we're in Acts chapter 6 today, but as we study it, I want us to remember that this paradigm shift, right, where before you had an iPhone, right, you had a camera, you had a computer, you had all those things, and now it's all in your pocket, and it's only continuing, right? And now your kids 
don't even know a world without it. They can't even imagine how we operated with having GPSs on our phones. And, and all those things are true, and it was just this paradigm that's taken us a while to get, and there's a lot of good that came with it, and then there's also challenges, right? I, I wonder what your screen time was before you ever had a smartphone. It's probably a little lower than it was yesterday. Uh, mine was for sure. Uh, and, and, and so there's this paradigm shift, and we see this church trying to figure that out. What does it mean to follow Jesus and wait for his return? What does it mean to be led by the Holy Spirit? And they're asking these questions. And at the same time, we, with our iPhone 15s, are looking back and we're like, we've experienced church, we know what church looks like in our culture, in our context, but we know that there's been distractions and things that have gotten in and pulled us away. And so I want us today to like look at the church and, and what we see in Acts, it's, it's, it's descriptive, it's not prescriptive, we're not supposed to just go do everything they did just because they did it, but we're supposed to look at it and see what God has for us to, to show us from how he's operating then and how would we bring that to our context instead of bringing our context and our culture into church. So we've been in Acts. Uh, today we're going to be in Acts chapter 6, but to give you a quick recap of Acts, uh, Acts begins with Jesus. He's recently resurrected. He's come back to life, and he's giving his, teaching his disp- apostles and his disciples and followers, and he kind of gives them this, this last commission. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and all- Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that's, how, that's his commission. All right, wait. You will receive power. And when that power has come, you're, you're witness. You're going to tell everyone about me. So that's how Jesus, le- and then he goes and he ascends, and disciples do that. They wait. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit pours out upon them, and miracles happen, and, and the people, thousands come to know the Lord. And in that, in that moment... They start to live as family. They start to do church. That's the birth of the church. Acts chapter 2, verse 44. You'll see, all the believers were together and had everything in common, right? That's what the church looked like. But they're still figuring out. This is still really, really early on. And then over the next couple of chapters, you see persecution. You see preaching and evangelism. You see generosity. You see people lying about generosity, right? There's some tension that starts to come into the church, And then you see more persecution, and all this kind of boils to a head to the passage that we are in today in Acts chapter 6. And so I'm going to start reading in verse 1 and go through verse 7. Would you guys read along with me? In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 got, uh, excuse me. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to the prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. We see this moment in the church where there's this tension arises. It's it's two groups, and there's a moment, are they going to get distracted by this tension, or is this going to be something that draws in their devotion towards each other? And we see in this passage, there's really two shifts that are made. There's the shift from being fractured to family. That's the first shift we see. And then the second shift we'll see in a minute is that there's a shift from being receivers to risk takers. But from fractured to family, right, we see these two groups. Look at verse one again with me. There's the Hebraic Jews and and there's the Grecian Jews. And and you see that with those, there's two different groups. And and for us, you might be thinking, well, they're Jews. It's all kind of similar. But there's actually pretty significant cultural differences here. So for the Hebraic Jews, they were people from the Jerusalem, from Israel area. They all spoke Aramaic. That was the language of the land. And so as they're going around, that's who Jesus was mostly with. He was walking around his teaching. If you want to think of a Hebraic Jew, right, Nicodemus, he, right, he was from there. So they kind of blent in with the Jewish culture. And if you, if you remember, we're very early on. There wasn't a distinction of, okay, here's the, here's the Christians and here's the Jews at this point. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. 
He was teaching, and so they're like, there's following this rabbi's teaching, but he's saying some pretty radical things, and so they're in this unknown zone, and the, and the Hebraic Jews were kind of in the midst of that unknown zone, because they blent in with the culture. They were Jews, they, they were the norm there. Well, then there's the Grecian Jews. These are Jews, people who followed God, but they were not from Israel. So that means either they converted, they were Greek, and they converted to Judaism before choosing to follow Jesus, or... It means that they were from somewhere else, their family had maybe moved away, and they had come back. And what it also meant is that they didn't speak Aramaic. So they didn't speak the language. They spoke Greek. And so prior to Jesus even being a thing in their lives, they were already outsiders. And so now in this moment, you see this tension between the insiders and the outsiders within the church. And, and, and in all likelihood, it was the Greek Jews who were getting the most persecution because they were the outsiders and they were or the Greek followers of Jesus. They were the outsiders and they were the people who were um, already an outsider and they were starting to follow this new teaching that everybody wasn't so sure about. And so there's this tension point and it bubbles to a head and they're saying, hey, you're not taking care of us. And it's really interesting because we don't really know what that looked like. We don't know if it was real or perceived um, I have kids, or if you've ever worked with kids, you know, there's, like, especially with large groups of kids, I used to run, help run an after school, and, and you'd have this moment where you were paying attention over here, and then you have two kids come to you, and you're like, he hit me. No, he hit me. And you're like, who hit who first? And you're like, I don't, this one doesn't normally hit, or maybe he's a better liar, I don't know. And, 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 and right, but there's this tension, and, and, you, and you can't solve it. And, and they go to the apostles, and they're like, hey, we need you to fix this. Because there's this tension, and, and we don't know who was at fault, and the apostles are like, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, they're like, hey, you actually solve this, but uh, the apostles say, okay, you guys appoint people, and how do they solve it? They solve it by acting like family. You hear us talk about live as family, uh, and, and if you think about our culture, family is actually something, like our nuclear family is, is something that's very familiar, you know, your parents and your kids, but uh, more often than not, you s- families spread out. Family is not something that's the norm in our culture, but I think a good thing that illustrates family is, is something that happened just the other night in our house. Um, we've got three boys, six, four, and two, and uh, the other night after dinner, I was looking at the time, I was like, hey, you know what? I think it'd be great, it'd be fun to teach our kids a new game. We were, I was going to teach, teach them how to play Farkle, if any of you all have ever played Farkle. It was a fun game, easy with dice. I knew my oldest would love it, my middle child would enjoy playing, and our two-year-old, he's not really old enough to play that game, but he could be along for the ride, sit in mom's lap while she plays kind of thing. Well, I forgot that Anna, my wife, had a phone call for work. So she was out. So I was like, okay, am I going to push through in this moment, play the game, or am I going to do something else? And I was like, you know what, let's push through. And at dinner, it was during dinner, everybody ate well except for our two-year-old, Everett. He decided that he wasn't hungry. And so the older boys got a piece of candy after, and, and then Everett didn't. And so I was like, we're starting to play the game, and Everett decides to make it known that he's very disappointed that he did not get a piece of candy. And so in this moment, right, I have, I have, I have, a, I have a point to choose. Like, are we going to sacrifice the fun of the entire family because one child is, is making everybody else's lives miserable, or, or are we going to push through, right? And, and we're going to focus on that, and we're going to let him be that. And in the, in the end, he actually resolved it for us. He figured out a way to climb on the counter, open the cabinet, knock the candy onto the floor, and eat as much as he wanted. Um, so the conflict was moved to the future when we're trying to teach self-control. Um, but, but it's a great illustration of family because in that moment, I was just sitting there and I was like, how do I know who to prioritize? Because our culture tells us to prioritize the individual. But the reality is this. Like, we are living as family, we're, we're as a church, we're called to live as family, and in, the mo- in these moments, you actually don't prioritize the individual, because in a family, there's a greater purpose. And in God's family, there is a greater purpose. And so what you see here is, what's really fascinating is if you hop to um, verse 5, and you look at the names of who they chose, you see how they operated as family. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And I'm guessing you're not experts in names, neither am I, but if you look at those names and you go compare them, those are all Greek names. So how did they solve this challenge? Is they said, you know what, we're gonna gonna trust the Greeks 
You're the ones who are saying you're feeling wronged. We're going to entrust this to you, and we're going to let you lead this. Above reproach. We're going to sacrifice what we think was working or maybe not working, and and we're going to put you guys ahead. And it's really easy, um, back to, right, this is iPhone 1, we're iPhone 15. Fast forward to today, right, you don't have to look beyond the church to see fractures in our culture, right? You know, you, you have the classic battles of pews versus chairs, or the color of the carpet, or hymns or hip songs, and, and all those things. You have charismatic, Baptist, Pentecostal, you have uh, Presbyterian, you have any, de- any, any denomination that I didn't include that's insulted that I didn't include them here, right? There's all, those, there's all of those things, Right? And, and, and what people see is this church divided, not this church living as family. And that's why, as we've been talking about what does church look like for us, and as we've been talking about what is our 10-year vision where we can impact our city, one of the biggest pieces of that is partnering with other churches. We're not going to do it alone. And planting other churches in the triangle, right? We're not creating competition. We're creating brothers and sisters who are going to impact our city. That's who we want to be. And it's crazy because there's all this division I just listed in the church, and it, it just mirrors our culture, right? There's division here in, in Raleigh. There's NC State and all of the teams that NC State beat on the way to winning the ACC tournament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go Pack, yeah. Um, and I just, I, I will say this. You can, uh, you can ask Pastor Dave and, and others who I sent my notes out to. I wrote that on Thursday, okay? Um, so, I, um, but there's legitimate Tension even in our city, right? It was not so long ago that we had peaceful protests and we had riots in our city. And all of that is infiltrating the church and then, and then people look at a divided church and you're, you're no different. What does it look like for us to be a people who live as family and are unified and we set Jesus as the stumbling block? It's really interesting too, though, because if you look at the passage, the, the Greeks and the, Hebrew, the Hebraic and the Grecian Jews, right, they didn't, they didn't lose their identity. That's one of those things that's really challenging to this, right? They didn't say, okay, you need to learn, everybody needs to learn Greek and we're start talking Greek now. They actually are separate. They still have their unique identities, but there's something that ties them together. And it's interesting that when you read Revelation, you see this same exact picture of Jesus' people, worshiping him, and it's not just all the people who look like one person. Look at Revelation 7, 9, and 10 with me. After this I looked, and before me there was a great multitude, no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a long voice, salvation belongs to the Lord who can sit on, who sits on the throne and to the lamb, right? He looks out and he sees a sea of diversity, all worshiping God in unison. That is a picture of what the church is supposed to be. Not fractured. We want Jesus to be the stumbling block, not how people vote. We want Jesus to be the thing that, pe- that we put the crux of the conversation on. Is he worth following? Because if he is, let's do it together Let's do it with other churches in our city. Let's live as family. And the second thing we see here is we see them going from receivers to, take, uh, to risk takers. Man, I said that. I said takers. That's an awful thing. Risk takers. Uh, I said that last night when I was practicing. My wife, I was like, it'd be bad if I messed that up. And here I go. Uh, so from receivers to risk takers. Look at verses one through four with me again. In those days when the number of disciples were increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. It's really interesting that all of, everybody came and they said, we're having this conflict, what do we do? You know what we should do? Let's go to the holiest person that we know, to the person who is closest to Jesus, and they'll know what to do. And so they go to the apostles. And for them, they were just doing church the way they knew how to do church, in the same way that many of us are here today, and and we've grown up doing church, and we kind of bring that with us wherever we go. 
but they were growing church. And for, for them, what church meant is they would go to the priest. And in our culture, we really don't have a, a big place for priests, maybe unless you grew up Catholic or Orthodox. And even in our culture, priests really have a pretty bad reputation. And so, and so for us, it's a little bit of a paradigm shift but I want you to think, through most of history and cultures, there's been this concept of a priest. And who the priest is, is they are this holy person, this holy man, who is you go to when you either want something from God or you want to offer something to God. God, I need your forgiveness. The priest says, well, go bring me a sacrifice. They bring him, the priest does the sacrifice, and he says, hey, you're forgiven. Or, uh, God, I want you to bless this crop. Okay, I'm going to bring some things to you. You're going to do this. I'm going to get my crop will be blessed. I want my child to be blessed, right? There's all these things that we, you'd go to the priest. The priest would, because they know God. They, they worked in the temple, right, the place where God's presence dwelled. And so they could answer God's questions for you. And so that was the default. But it's really interesting how the apostles respond to it. They say, you choose, it's this paradigm shift. Don't be a receiver. You don't need to just receive. You need to go through this priest. You need to be the ones to go take ownership of this. You choose. And um, as I was prepping this, I was talking with Pastor Dave, and he brought up Jesus feeding the 5,000. And he's like, this is such a great parallel. And I thought, man, so glad to have Dave around. Um, but let me read this. This is in Mark chapter 6, verse 34. This is when Jesus feeds the 5,000. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, so he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so the disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and village and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. Then they said, uh, they said to him, that would take eight months of wages. Are we going to go and spend that much on bread to give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fishes. Right? They went to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, there's a problem. Jesus looked at them and said, solve the problem. And it's funny because they actually don't solve the problem. They sit there in, in bewilderment and don't know what to do. But apparently, between then and now, between Jesus dying and being resurrected, between the coming of the Holy Spirit, something clicked for them, and they get it. They, we have all been empowered to go do ministry. It does not need to come through the holy man. Uh, Hebrews 14 puts it this way. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was that without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Didn't say go to the priest, didn't say go to the apostle, didn't say go to the pastor. It said approach the throne of God. So often we think that there's some barrier between us and God, and we need some intermediary. And we do, but it's not any one human, it's Jesus. And so as a church, we're talking about reimagining church, we're talking about how do we impact our entire city as one small church here in Raleigh. And it's not by going through people, but it's by the Holy Spirit working through all of us. And so uh, one of my roles here at Southbridge is I lead outreach. And you hear me uh, share things about stuff that we've done as a church. Sometimes you hear us come up with ideas and ways we want to impact our city. But one thing we want to get better at is how do we empower you to do ministry? Because we can stand up here on the stage and say, hey, everybody, go do this. And there's a moment for that, and there might be some of you who need something to spur you on, but can you imagine what if Southbridge was not known as the church who did, who did outreach in our city and cared for our city well, but what if Southbridge was known as the church where, hey, they have small groups who care for their neighbors because the, a tree fell on their neighbor's deck, they can't replace it, that small group went and rebuilt it. What if they're known as a church where there's a small group and they care for the homeless people, right? There's someone who comes in their lives and, and they, they come around that person and help them find a job. And so often, our default as church, and this is not necessarily 
the churches, the, the people who come to church's fault, because churches have set it up this way, including us at times. And they say, hey, we have this idea. You guys go do it. What you see is the apostles are here. They're handing the ministry back. And they're saying, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the power. Now go do it. It's really, really one of the things that happens a little bit after this is there's some persecution. The church spreads. And the churches get planted all over. And one of the most famous churches is the church in Antioch. And believe it or not, we don't know who planted it. Because there's just some people who were in, in Jerusalem. They got persecuted. They moved to Antioch, started church. That's the church that sent Paul out. That sent all sorts of missions all over the world. They, they just owned their impact. They didn't wait for, hey, we need someone to come plant a church here. No, they, they stepped into it. And now, as you're hearing me say this, you, you hear the word risk taker, and you think, well, aren't, aren't they just asking these guys to do, like, an administrative task? Uh, shouldn't they just, like, you know, couldn't they just go ahead and, like, they're handing out food? Like, what does that have to do with spiritual wisdom? It's really interesting, right? The Holy Spirit and wisdom are the requirements, but aren't they doing that? And, and it is interesting. But what you notice is you never hear the names of most of these guys ever again. And so you can probably just assume that they faithfully served in that way. But there's two guys you do here, the first two listed, Stephen and Philip. And they, you actually hear about them in the next couple of pages of your Bible. And what you see is in this moment where they stepped into ministry and they were commissioned by the disciples, God calls them up to even more. Uh, the, the very next story that happens in Acts, Stephen goes out, he preaches, he's killed. Shortly thereafter, Philip is taken up in a whirlwind, and God puts him next to an Ethiopian, and through Philip, the gospel goes out to the nations. So what you see is, like, what you think are these little baby steps are, is actually the God, is God working in you and moving the gospel forward. For me, I can think of the fact of, like, I was in college. I was in a small group. I got invited to do a little bit more and a little bit more. And I think we can all think of someone in our lives who maybe helped us take those steps of faith. Or if you can't, maybe you've desired that. And that's what we want to talk, we talk about a lot as a church is who are you in a disciple-making relationship with? Who is someone who's a half a step ahead and moving with you? And then who's someone who's a half a step behind you and moving that you can take with you and help them walk this journey of faith? Help take people from being receivers, coming to Sunday and receiving. And you don't have to just be an attendant to receive. You can be a, someone who serves every week and be just here for a receiver. Maybe you're serving because you think that's going to earn you favor with God. Or maybe you're serving because you're like, that's how I meet God. But I don't, if I serve, then I don't have to pray and read the Bible. No. Like, God wants to meet you where you're at. But what we see is the church has to make this decision. Do we want to be content where we used to be? sitting here receiving, or do we want to step out and take a risk? And, and like I said, just to kind of peel back the curtain, um, I want to share a little bit more about what's going on. on. On Mondays, we have our staff meetings at Southbridge, and in our staff meetings, we share praises and celebrations and things, and just to, so everybody can know what's going on. And one, one consistent thing that we've been hearing about is from our student ministry that's been really, really cool. Uh, DJ, who leads it, and Madison, they have decided to create a student leadership team. And this student leadership team was created with a heart to disciple some of those students. And so what it's looked like is they, they went and they talked to their adult leaders who used to have different roles on Sunday night and in other things. They said, hey, adult leaders, we don't actually need you to set up the chairs anymore. Uh, and we don't need you to lead some of our group times anymore. Um, and so the adult leaders, okay, what do you need us to do? And they're like, we want you to invest in the students who are gonna be doing those things. And it's been so cool because the stories I hear about the students isn't that they're doing those things really great, although I think they're doing a good job. Is the stories that I hear about the students is all of a sudden we see, hey, our leadership team, when they see someone new, they make that outsider feel like an insider. Hey, our leadership team, they're out there, they're sharing their faith and inviting people in. They're taking risks. It's the same progression that God asks of us, right? So serving is a huge piece of that, but it's not the end in and of itself. Like the Lord wants to work in us. And so how do we do that? 
And it all kind of boils back down to what we saw in, in Acts 1, right? It's the power of the Holy Spirit, right? The, the conditions that they were looking for. Hey, f- what did the apostles say? Hey, find us some men who are filled with the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And so that, that just leaves us asking the question, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you filled with wisdom? That's a challenging question, but that's one that hinge, everything hinges on. Because we can have all these extracurriculars, we can look really unified, we can be really busy with serving, but if we're not connected to Jesus, we're missing the boat. Right? We're still distracted, we're not devoted. And that's a hard, challenging question. And the language we've been using around that here at Southbridge is our own personal spiritual transformation leads to gospel saturation in our city. A lot of people love to jump to that gospel saturation, but it's really easy to miss that first step. And if that first step doesn't happen, the rest is all in vain. And it's just our own striving. And at Southbridge, we kind of ask ourselves these three questions, right? Do we, are you enjoying God? Am I living as family? Am I taking a risk to measure how healthy am I? Because if those are out of whack, if you're just you know, taking a risk and living as family, that other piece is missing. Or if you're really enjoying God fully, you're, you're, you're loving your time with him, but you don't ever take a risk, a piece is missing. And so that's why we want to encourage you, right? We need to be in these disciple-making relationships where people walk with you step by step and help you progress and grow. And you are doing the same with others. One of my very favorite verses is Acts 4.13. Um, uh, so if you guys want to, I'll turn there real quick. Actually, as I have the NIV, I'm reading the NLT. I have, that's the one I have memorized. But the, the members of the council, Acts 4.13, what happens is basically the disciples um, Peter and John have just been arrested for doing miracles. They're trying to slow them down. And so they're in front of the council. So the council, uh, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they recognized that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. I think that's how a lot of us feel. Hey, I'm just ordinary. I don't have any special training. But the key piece is the next part of the verse. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Do people recognize you as someone who's been with Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just wanna lift up um, everyone in this room and just ask that you would work in us and work on our hearts, because God, we all have this tendency to strive. I know I have this tendency to strive and you are so good, and you love us. Help us to just sit here and enjoy you, and receive you, and spend time with you, so we look like someone who spent time with you. And, not, and knowing that through that, the, the natural overflow of our lives is gonna be your gospel going forward. Lord, you're so good to us, and you're so kind to us, and I just pray that you would help everyone in this moment to just see what's that next step of faith for them and to be willing to take that. And we ask all of this in your name. Amen. my
And it's hard not to enjoy God fully with worship like this. Um, my name is DJ Cronrath. I am the student pastor here. And I just wanted to um, just say something that Danny said uh, real quick, that being receivers um, is something that I've definitely done in church a lot. But I, I think a lot of you are ready to be risk takers. I, I think after this message, it's something that maybe it's a step forward for you. Uh, there's a lot of you that are the risk takers that have done it, but like Pastor Danny said, maybe you're doing it alone. You're not living as family, and that's something that you're missing part of that triangle. Uh, some of you, maybe they're not enjoying God. Worship's great, but outside of Sunday mornings, you're not enjoying God, and so you're not ready to take those risks. So I just wanna challenge you, you know, to take that message home, to be more than receivers and to be risk takers. But uh, Pastor Danny brought up the student leadership team and I just wanted to, first of all, thank him for that. They have been such a blessing to myself and Madison. Students are serving in ways that I couldn't have even imagined when we were thinking up the program and trying to just figure out how we're gonna do this, who are gonna be on the team. But um, they've done things I also couldn't do. You know, inviting other students in it's something I can do. I, I can talk to students, I could invite them in, but students don't necessarily wanna stay just because of me. Uh, and I've seen these students encouraging new students to sit with them uh, Sunday nights, uh, bringing students from Sunday mornings that they see, hey, you're a teenager, I'm a teenager, come with me Sunday night. Uh, but one story in particular really stood out to me. We were uh, doing student serves over the summer we were uh, at an apartment outreach and some students approached a teenager they saw there and invited him back to church, uh, invited him to Sunday night hang our youth group. And it took a couple months because that was uh, before we started. Uh, but once that student came to the first Sunday night hang, um, our leadership team embraced him. Not necessarily literally, but they, uh, they all crowded around him, started talking to him, invited him to sit with them uh, which was just so cool, because if I had done that, he probably wouldn't have wanted to sit with me. Um, but having students invite someone to sit with them is so powerful. And then seeing them not only do that, but uh, play games with him, encourage him to do other things. One student went as far as bringing him home because he was gonna take an Uber. And so he drove him home. And that was them taking one step forward, just doing something that was kind of easy. And then I've seen students actually going to the extent of uh, sharing their faith with their coworkers and jobs they have to uh, teaching Sunday night. Some of them have offered to teach a message and you know, like Pastor Danny said, it takes steps sometimes, but they were willing to do it. I'm not here to say that this story or um, the student ministry is perfect. There's so much we could still grow. But as we're looking to reimagine how we do student ministry, you know, as a church, how are we reimagining church? I think that comes together that comes from you in your own context, living as family, enjoying God fully and taking risks. And so I hope today as you leave, you can see which one am I not doing and how maybe can I take that risk or stop being a receiver and take that risk, live as family, or how can I just enjoy God? So I'm just gonna close in a quick prayer. Father, let's thank you so much to be in a church where we care about others. We care about everyone here, we're our family. Lord, I just thank you for exciting worship, great messages to help us just to really know and understand how to enjoy you. But Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit is able to empower us to take risks, to step out in our faith and to go and change um, RDU. It's in your name we pray, amen.